I'm Phil Gale. Welcome to the program. The UN says almost half of Gaza's population has now moved to the city of Rafah in the south, where they are facing bombardment, deprivation and disease in a space that's becoming increasingly overcrowded. Despite growing calls for a ceasefire, Israel says it will push on with its offensive against Hamas, which is considered a terrorist organization by numerous countries. Winters bearing down on Rafah, the city at the farthest edge of southern Gaza, bordering Egypt. With the border closed, it's the farthest people can flee. A destination for displaced Gazans hoping to escape bombardment. Shelters are overcrowded. Almost half of Gaza's population is now in Rafah, which is the a small part of Gaza in the southeast corner. Again, this is leading to nothing but a health crisis. Rainfall makes an already dire situation worse. Many makeshift tents can't hold up for long against the wind and rainwater. Yasmin, a displaced Palestinian mother, says she lacks access to basic necessities. I woke up to my seven-month-old child who was soaking wet. Our house has been destroyed, my other child was martyred. I don't have any blankets or mattresses. I took some for my sister. We just have one blanket between five of us. There's no covers, no mattresses, no food, no water. Life is difficult. Humanitarian relief is barely reaching ordinary people like Yasmin, despite their proximity to the only crossing that allows aid into the Gaza Strip. Israel's military, which is also carrying out strikes on targets in Rafah, blames Hamas for the lack of access. Unfortunately, it's not the Israeli side that are preventing it, but rather what we're seeing this morning right. is that Hamas are not uh, opening the, the Palestinian side of Rafah and not facilitating the access of the humanitarian aid itself. So we need to ask ourselves again, why is Hamas preventing humanitarian aid? While the UN General Assembly has called for a humanitarian ceasefire, people in Rafah are pessimistic. Israel is well known for ignoring UN and international resolutions. It considers itself above the law. Because of that, I don't think it will accept any resolution. With winter just setting in, many fear the hardship and danger that lie ahead. Well, Stephen Ryan is Rapid Deployment Coordinator with the International Red Cross Committee. He joins us from Gaza. A welcome to DW. Uh, can we start with your assessment of the situation in the territory at the moment? Well, the situation for civilians here in Gaza continues to remain a living nightmare. Last night, there was uh, strong winds and rain and which tens of thousands of people or more living in tents or under plastic sheeting. The situation is extremely difficult for families who are trying to look after their, their children and for people who don't have access to enough food, enough water, enough shelter. And genuinely, it's really a really difficult situation for people here. And now, the, the UN humanitarian coordinator for, for Gaza says almost half of the territory's population is now in Rafa. That's hundreds of thousands of people. And what are you seeing there? Well, just over 10 days ago, I passed by one site, one location, uh, not far from where our offices are based, and I saw that there was a couple of dozen tents. Uh, I passed by one week later, a few days ago, and there was hundreds, if not more. Certainly tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people are on the move here in Gaza, and many of those people are fleeing only with what they're able to carry. And in a situation like that, some very basic items become the most valuable. Uh, a mattress, a blanket, maybe a meager supply of food. And when they arrive to these places, they're already very, very crowded. There's not enough, if any, sanitation facilities. People have to queue for a very long time for water, and nobody knows what tomorrow is going to bring. Certainly, seeing that there's efforts to bring in more assistance into Gaza, this, this is a positive development. But one of the things that we're deeply concerned about is their ability to meet these growing needs that are uh, growing by the hour and to be able to reach people who are not in Rafa. Certainly, there are uh, still many more people, civilians, who are protected under international humanitarian law who are outside of Rafa. And we also need to make sure that 
uh, international organisations such as the International Committee of the Red Cross and any others that are able to work here are able to provide assistance to these people in safety. And while fighting continues, that's an extremely difficult task. Right. And, and, and the, the problem, one of many, uh, is, is, is there at the end, you said, to, to be able to, for international humanitarian organisations, to be able to work in safety. So this is hampering your ability to do your job under these, these arduous circumstances. You yourselves uh, feel uh, in, endangered. Well, certainly the International Committee of the Red Cross is no stranger to working in difficult environments. In fact, the very basis of our work is uh, helping people who are affected by conflict, civilians, no matter who they are, no matter where they are. And of course, we engage with all of the parties in dialogue to remind them that we're a neutral organization that is not going to take sides. Our goal is to try and provide assistance to civilians, people who are in desperate need. But to do that, we need to have access to, do, to, to reach the places where they are. We need to ensure that uh, it's safe for us to do so so that we can continue doing this job tomorrow. Parties to this conflict need to understand and to respect that the role of the Red Cross is to help civilians. Okay. And it's extremely difficult for us to do that in these conditions. On just staying with aid, Israel says it's working to expand shipments of humanitarian aid into southern Gaza. Um, earlier here on DW, we had a, an IDF spokesman who was blaming Hamas for not opening the Palestinian side of the Rafah crossing. Uh, what are you seeing? Well, from our point of view, I'm like, we see uh, relief trickling into Gaza at, at the current rate of not meeting the needs that are immense. Definitely any efforts that are going to allow more aid to come into Gaza are going to be welcomed. But there's no limit to the amount of aid that's going to be needed here. People are desperate. There isn't enough food, there isn't enough water, and there isn't the capacity in organizations such as ours to be able to respond to those needs in these conditions. While we certainly welcome anything that's going to speed up the uh, delivery of aid into Gaza, there needs to be a, 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 an approach which enables us to deliver that aid quickly and to where it's needed most. And that is not limited to just Rafa. That's throughout southern Gaza and beyond. Because wherever civilians are, they are protected under international humanitarian law. And organizations such as ours who want to be able to provide this assistance need to be enabled to do so by the parties to the conflict. Okay. And of course, we again appeal to all states to use their influence to make sure that we are able to do our jobs and that the parties to the conflict allow us to do so. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Stephen Ryan of the International Red Cross Committee. Thank you. Israel is coming under pressure from key allies over its war in Gaza. After months of staunch support, US President Joe Biden criticized Israel on Tuesday for, quote, indiscriminate bombing in Gaza. A vote by the UN General Assembly also indicates Israel's growing isolation on the world stage. Member nations overwhelmingly backed a resolution demanding an immediate humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza. But Israel insists it will persist with its air and ground offensive against Hamas, which is classified as a terror group by the US, the EU and several other countries. There was celebration at the UN as the ceasefire resolution passed, with more than three quarters of the General Assembly voting in favour. Israel's UN ambassador had argued before the vote that the resolution would only benefit Hamas. But just a handful of countries joined Israel and its closest ally, the US, in voting no. Today was a historic day in terms of the powerful message that was sent from the General Assembly, and it is our collective duty to continue in this path until we see an end to this aggression against our people. While the vote in New York demonstrates much of the world wants an end to the fighting, the Israeli government seems determined to press on. It has repeatedly ruled out ending military operations until all the hostages in Gaza are freed and Hamas is dismantled. That's despite thousands of Palestinian casualties and the increasingly dire humanitarian situation for those trapped within the besieged territory. 
These aid trucks entering the southern city of Rafa from Egypt are Gaza's lifeline. But far too few are making it through. On Tuesday, Israel said it would facilitate more aid deliveries by starting to check aid trucks at the Kerem Shalom checkpoint. Before the Hamas terrorist attacks on October 7th, most goods entered Gaza via this Israeli crossing. Now, Israel says convoys will only be inspected at Kerem Shalom and will still have to enter from Egypt. Joining me now in the studio is our Middle East analyst, Shani Rosanis. Hi, Shani. Um, so we've seen this UN uh, uh, General Assembly vote um, for a ceasefire. We've heard President uh, Biden speaking very clearly, criticizing Israel for indiscriminate bombing in Gaza. Do you think that this will have any effect in, in uh, pushing Israel to change its course? Well, it's clear from Israeli officials' uh, statements that they know that the clock is ticking. International support is not going to last for too long. They're already starting to talk about some finish line, at least for this part of the offenses. We've seen it in a couple of weeks uh, before or after 2024 starts. That's unclear, but it's clear that it's it's not much longer than that. Um, but we need to keep in mind, you know, we were mentioning the UN, which, which is three, three quarters of, of nations were, were standing, you know, in favor of the ceasefire. The Americans are not there. And this is the most important thing for Israel. As long as they have American support and backing to keep on fighting against Hamas, they will do that. And despite the criticism we've been seeing from Biden, Israel feels that it has the support of the Americans for the immediate goal of eradicating Hamas's rule in Gaza. The problems start when we start talking about the end game for Gaza. This is where we see more and more um, the rifts between Israel and the Americans and the rest of the international community growing bigger and bigger. So you would say that pressure is clearly growing on Israel right Definitely. now? Definitely. I mean, you see the Americans, we, I mean, they're very much deeply involved in what's happening in Israel. The uh, national security advisor, the American one, is going to be heading to Israel tomorrow, uh, Jack Sullivan. He wants to know what's the deadlines. He wants to know what Israel has in mind. And this is exactly where Israel and the Americans are going back and forth for quite some time now. Uh, the Americans say, where, where do you see Gaza the day after? And Israel keeps saying, Israel keeps saying, well, first we need to get there and then we'll see. And we've seen Netanyahu more and more vocal in the last couple of days against any consideration of bringing the Palestinian Authority, the revitalized, reformed one, into Gaza. And this is something the Americans are very not happy with. They want to see a solution for Gaza as part of a solution for the whole Palestinian problem. They also know this is the only way to bring in support for reconstruction of Gaza from Arab countries like the Saudi Arabia and UAE and other Gulf countries that say we're not going to help Israel solve the Gaza problem uh, when they keep on indiscriminately bombing people without talking about a long term solution for Palestinians. And this is something Netanyahu is unequivocally not even willing to consider right now. I wanted to ask you about the um, trucks, aid trucks, that, that are being inspected mm -hmm. by Israel at the Kerem Shalom crossing, but we know that the trucks can still only enter Gaza through the Rafa crossing. Can you explain to us what the point of that is? I mean, why hasn't the Kerem Shalom crossing also been opened? Wouldn't that make it easier? Well, to be honest, it's about keeping up appearance. Israel said exactly right after the 7th of October attack happened, we are cutting ties from Gaza. We don't want to, not want to be in charge of what's coming in, what's coming out. Everything that happens needs to go through Egypt. You know, we're rolling that ball to Egypt's uh, lap. But we know also, again, talking about the Americans and their pressure, there is a mountain pressure for bringing in more humanitarian aid. The Rafah crossing is, out, is, is not as advanced as the Kerem Shalom one, the one in Israel, the Kerem Shalom one, which was the one in use, the main one in use up until October um, 7th attack, is far more advanced and can process many more trucks. So Israel is processing the trucks in the Kerem Shalom crossing, but then sending them back to Egypt to go through Rafah. There is an understanding, partially probably we will see that part of the pressure applied by Sullivan tomorrow and the Americans saying, drop the theatrics, drop the techniques, let's bring aid in in the most efficient way. If it means it comes directly through Israel, let's do that because this is technically, you know, technical elements that are eventually not helping anybody because if we're seeing more and more uh, deaths in Gaza and the dire situation there, it's not even helping in the benefit of Israel and its, in its cause in, in you know, uh, trying to uh, push Hamas away from, from the Strip. Middle East analyst Shani Rosanis. Thanks so much, Shani. You're welcome.